Late June 2015. It is a quiet day at the Doctors Without Borders Ebola Treatment Unit in Conakry, the capital of Guinea. Voilà, c'est très calme. J'étais ici entre euh, bah, septembre et fin janvier, et à cette époque-là, on avait entre 50 et 80 patients. Bah, Aujourd'hui, on en a zéro. We are interrupted by a phone call. Oui, dis-moi. Un cas confirmé ou un. Et on sait que c'est un enfant qui euh, a été bon, qui présente des symptômes. A few hours later, the information is transmitted to the WHO vaccine trial headquarters. A new victim of Ebola is added to the board. Et ça a été confirmé. Ça a été confirmé par le laboratoire. They must quickly identify who has come into contact with the child. The epidemic is dwindling, and this may be the last chance to test the Canadian vaccine's efficacy, even though this vaccine was discovered a decade ago. Quand ça tombe par douzaines à tous les jours, et qu'à chaque fois, tu fais ce que tu peux, tu leur mets leur intraveineuse, tu essaies de les irhydrater, mais qu'au bout de la ligne, le constat et le, le dénouement des sorts va être la même, c'est ça qui est difficile. Et ça se répète, et ça se répète, et ça se répète. It was the deadliest Ebola outbreak on record, and health workers couldn't count on a vaccine or treatment to help them confront it. They saw thousands of their patients and hundreds of their colleagues die. We should have seen an Ebola vaccine prior to 24. Okay? We should have, that we're in the freezer. On comprend tous que l'industrie, enfin c'est pas des philanthropes, c'est bien clair. Donc l'industrie ne peut produire des, quelque chose que s'il y a un marché. C'est la base de l'économie. After the Ebola crisis that gripped West Africa for months, Guineans are now trying to return to a normal life and get their economy back on track. But billboards everywhere are a constant reminder that it's too early for the country to let down its guard. Every public building monitors for fever and requires anyone who enters to disinfect their hands. The National Coordination Committee for the Ebola Response in Guinea meets three times a week. It must account for every new case of the disease in order to prevent a new chain of infection from starting. Les parents de la petite s'étaient échappés. D'après les, les dernières informations, comme je le disais, ils seraient été retrouvés. Et on espère que les actions vont porter leurs fruits pour qu'ils soient transférés au centre de traitement. All the international partners gather here. The CDC, Doctors Without Borders, the French government, even the Public Health Agency of Canada. Partners who at times need to be confronted with the harsh reality of everyday life in Guinea. It's a lot of them to say to the French people. To do the nettoyage, but to help them to have a source of food. This joint international effort is a far cry from the situation 15 months ago, when everyone seemingly ignored or refused to acknowledge the Ebola crisis that was to become the deadliest in history. If you ask me if there is no retard, there is no retard in the procedures. But you have to recognize that this disease has also tromped the majority of the people who were in charge of managing it, because we thought that it was an epidemic that would not be very long. March 2014. The first cases of Ebola were officially identified in the village of Gikidu. It was the Zaire strain, the deadliest. It was the first time the virus appeared in Guinea. An emergency medical team from Doctors Without Borders was dispatched. The staff quickly realized this outbreak was different. Vu qu'à ce moment-là, il y avait des cas à plus de 250 km de distance, on s'est dit c'est vraiment une épidémie qui est différente, qui est géographiquement très, très, très euh, éparpillée. Mais nous, ça nous inquiétait parce qu'on savait que c'était quand même possiblement une bombe à retardement.
Over the next two months, the organization's many calls for help fell on deaf ears. Neither the government of Guinea nor the World Health Organization took action, in part to avoid causing panic and hurting the country's economy. Meanwhile, the epidemic reached the capital, Conakry, and neighboring countries, Sierra Leone and Liberia. C'est qui la première personne dans votre famille qui a été atteinte de la maladie et comment c'est arrivé? Non, la première personne, tu sais que c'est un moment qu'elle a été la première malade. Les deux jours après, ma grande sœur aussi, elle est décédée. On ne sait pas comment vivre maintenant. Umar Touré and his brother Sekou are survivors of Ebola. They lost six members of their family during the outbreak. They both spent three weeks in an Ebola treatment center. Umar's oldest brother died in his arms. Mais d'une fois qu'on lui donne de manger, il rejette. Il ne boit pas. Il était derrière moi, il était sur devant de son lit. Il, il voulait descendre à terre. Je me suis retourné, j'ai attrapé. J'avais les médecins là-bas. Je l'appelais de venir m'aider pour que mon, il puisse retourner mon frère au lit. Et aussi, il n'a pas pu descendre. Il, il tremblait jusqu'à il a rendu là. Tous les jours, on fait sortir deux corps, quatre corps, six corps. Donc, toi aussi, tu, peux, tu penserais que demain, ça, ça, ça serait mon tour aussi. When the epidemic began, authorities in affected countries repeated the same message to the population. Ebola is a deadly virus for which there is no cure. As a result, many refused to go to treatment centers, at times using violence as a means to resist, further contributing to the spread of the virus. Allez dire à quelqu'un que il y a une maladie qui tue à plus de 50 Il n'y a pas de traitement. Il faut que vous fassiez soigner dans un centre avec des cosmonautes euh, loin de votre famille, puis vous allez probablement mourir tout seul. Moi, je suis désolée. C'est pas sexy, puis ça marche pas, puis c'est pas vendeur. There were incidences where health workers were attacked. At the start of the outbreak, all sorts of rumors fueled mistrust of doctors. Et puis je discutais même avec certains de mes amis qui n'ont pas su que si Ebola existe, que c'était un bonté, que c'est c'est on, on dit même il y a un prononcement qu'on dit Ebola business, que c'est de la business ou quoi. C'est de la mal compréhension quoi. C'est de la mal compréhension. Certains détracteurs ont alimenté que c'est les Européens qui ont introduit cette maladie en, en Guinée et qui vendent même les organes des gens qui sont victimes. D'autres esprits malins aussi ont diffusé que c'est le virus qui est contenu et que c'est nos agents qui diffusent le virus contre la population et que c'est une maladie inventée. Il y a eu des préjugés suite à la déclaration du fait qu'on a dit qu'il n'y a pas de médicaments ni de vaccins et qu'on fait par endroit que les gens n'ont pas adopté le comportement qu'on souhaitait pour le contrôle rapide de cette épidémie. Fear and mistrust affected not only the general population, but extended to health workers as well, making it increasingly difficult to recruit them. Nous sommes des victimes directes. Je n'ai pas mis pied dans un centre sanitaire pour travailler parce que j'avais peur. Nos collègues directs sont partis, sont morts. Vous avez Donc, des collègues qui sont morts? Oui, des collègues qui sont morts, qui sont partis, des médecins qui sont partis, qui sont décédés. Au début, c'était difficile, hein? Il y a des gens qui disaient, même si on me dit des millions, je ne vais pas venir. Hein. Beaucoup refusaient de venir travailler. Il manquait de monde ici Oui, il n'y avait pas assez de monde. Hein. Nous, on a commencé, je pense, on était 12 comme ça. On était 12 staff comme ça. Mais Pourquoi? des fois, on, moi, par exemple, j'ai recruté quelqu'un. Je l'ai fermé. Le lendemain, il m'a appelé qu'il ne va pas travailler ici, que ses parents ne veulent pas, que lui-même, il a peur. The health system in affected countries was already fragile and could not cope with the outbreak. There was a shortage of everything from supplies to protective gear, even training. The virus decimated the workforce. Treatment centers run by Doctors Without Borders were strained and overstretched. A record number of the organization's health workers became infected. Within three months, the epidemic spread to more than 60 different locations. Doctors Without Borders released a statement describing the outbreak as out of control. Ça nous prenait des outils différents. On rêvait d'un traitement, c'est sûr, parce que c'était tellement, mais tellement difficile euh, apporter des soins aux patients. 
Et l'autre chose aussi, c'est qu'on se disait, si on avait un outil pour faire la prévention de la maladie, ça serait, ça serait merveilleux. Others called for the same thing. Jeremy Farrar heads the Welcome Trust, the world's second highest spending charitable foundation in health issues. But I remember writing about this in June, calling for studies of, of drugs and, and vaccines. And I, I still remember now, at that point in June, there were 200 deaths. You know, by the end of the year, that was, that was getting towards ten, tens of thousands, 10,000 or more deaths. I am declaring the current outbreak of Ebola virus disease a public health emergency of international concern. August 2014. Thousands had already died from Ebola by the time the WHO declared the outbreak a global health crisis, calling on the world to mobilize. The organization decided to authorize the use of experimental treatments and drugs in affected countries. But there was a problem. None of the pharmaceutical products were ready to be used on humans. Tous ces, ces vaccins, ces médicaments qui étaient encore à un stade très très préliminaire, puisqu'en fait rien n'avait encore été testé chez l'homme, on s'est dit c'est pas possible, il faut il faut il faut y aller. Et ceci a été vraiment le début de l'engagement de l'OMS pour la recherche. In 1976, an international team of doctors landed in Nyambuku, Zaire. A mysterious disease was terrifying the local population. Belgian microbiologist Peter Piot and his colleagues discovered a new virus and called it Ebola, the name of the river that runs through the region. Until two months ago, doctors didn't even know this virus existed. They know now because hundreds of people infected by it are dead. Since then, there have been 23 separate outbreaks in Africa, affecting dozens to hundreds of people every time. The virus was usually isolated in remote areas and never really attracted much international attention, least of all from the pharmaceutical industry. But that was before the events of 9-11. One week after the attacks in New York, letters laced with anthrax were sent in the mail, killing five people. Authorities in the U.S. turned their attention to pathogens that could be used by terrorists, including the Ebola virus. Increases in funding for biological warfare in the United States and Canada prompted new research into vaccines and treatments. Over the years, Canada spent $7 million on Ebola research. Ça faisait partie des, des priorités dans le domaine de la recherche euh, de solutions euh, biologiques à des, des menaces biologiques. C'est euh, le département de défense nationale du Canada qui, euh, qui a subventionné et supporté, qui a cru euh, les premiers euh, au vaccin VSV et au traitement aussi. Dr. Gary Cobinger is in demand as a public speaker. Je pense qu'on a sous-estimé beaucoup la capacité de, du virus. He is currently chief of special pathogens at the National Microbiology Laboratory in Winnipeg, the only biosafety level 4 site in Canada, where work is conducted on some of the world's most hazardous organisms. He arrived at the lab in 2005, taking over work that had already begun on the vaccine. His many field trips to Africa helped him gain first-hand knowledge of the devastation caused by the disease. Pour nous, les scientifiques, ce qui était important, c'était de développer un vaccin. Euh, puis pour nous, l'intérêt vraiment majeur, c'était d'aider les populations qui souffraient de, euh, de l'émergence de ce virus-là. En 2005, le laboratoire a proudly annoncé qu'il avait développé un vaccin prouvé à être efficace dans les primates. For sure, this work is certainly, I think, uh, one of the biggest achievements of this facility. The next step was to test it on humans and get the regulatory bodies to approve it. The first step, of course, is to make a, a clinically usable, a human fit 
um, vaccine and, and that has to be done by a commercial company with expertise in, in developing it. It's not the sort of thing that this facility can take on. The search for a pharmaceutical company began. It would be responsible for bringing the vaccine to market. En fait, avait personne avait de l'expérience à l'époque sur comment on amène un produit vraiment du laboratoire à la clinique. Euh, puis je pense qu'il y, y, y a un optimisme très grand des chercheurs qui se disent euh, c'est tellement bon, on veut tellement, on y croit tellement aussi. That process proved to be more difficult than expected. No one seemed interested in acquiring the vaccine license. It took five years to find a pharmaceutical partner in the U.S. Normalement, euh, quand il s'est senti qu'il y a un intérêt, euh, c'est des offres qu'il qu faut qu'ils soient euh, mises publiques, puis tout le monde peut euh, faire une offre pour euh, dire, OK, nous, mais nous, on a, c'est ça, on, notre projet, on veut faire ci, puis est-ce qu'on peut avoir la licence? À l'époque, il y avait tellement peu d'intérêt, en fait, que euh, la façon dont ça s'est fait, c'est euh, il y avait un chercheur qui travaillait avec, la, avec le, le lab, euh, qui est parti aux États-Unis pour travailler, euh, incluant pour cette compagnie. New Link, puis qui a commencé à leur dire, mais ce vaccin-là, c'est vraiment super, euh, etc., okay. etc. Ouais. New Link Genetics is a small biotechnology company based in Iowa. In 2010, its bioprotection systems division paid $205,000 to acquire the vaccine license. It is impossible to keep up with the sheer number of infected people pouring in our facilities. In Sierra Leone, infectious bodies are rotting in the streets. On September 2, 2014, Doctors Without Borders made another desperate plea, this time to the United Nations. There was an urgent need for tangible support in the field. With pressure mounting, the WHO called a special meeting in Geneva with over 200 officials, scientists, philanthropists, and representatives from the pharmaceutical industry. How can we take the thing which are the most promising of these unproven medical products and make sure that they are developed the, with the highest speed possible? In an effort to halt the epidemic, the WHO gave the green light to accelerate a process that usually takes years. We said, look, we're willing to fund sensible ideas to move diagnostics, treatment, vaccine. And then we said, we will uh, fast track, and I mean fast track, I mean make decisions within hours or days, uh, and then make monies available to the most promising candidates for those areas. Eight experimental treatments and two vaccines were selected including the Canadian VSV EBOV vaccine, partly because there were already 1,500 vials of it. Dr. Marie-Paul Kini hoped the vaccines would be distributed in November 2014 to frontline health workers. You only have about 120 minutes in your suit and you have all of these patients. Sometimes we would be squeezing the bottle of the patient next to the person we're examining. So I was doing that with a bunch of bottles and there were a bunch of needles in it and I pulled the needles out because I didn't want to stick myself. I walked uh, to where the sharps containers were supposed to be and they were all full. So I moved the needle and stuck it right through my thumb. It happened at the end of September 2014 in Kenema, Sierra Leone. Dr. Louis Rubinson was volunteering with the WHO. Conditions in the hospital were nothing short of chaotic. My first reaction was, okay, I'm not telling anyone, <laughs> right? You know, I just don't want to deal with this right now. I'm tired. And then I started to feel the bleeding in, in my thumb and I'm like, all right, now I kind of have to, you know, deal with this. Less than 48 hours later, he was on board a private jet on his way to the US. American authorities offered him a choice of experimental treatments and vaccines. He picked the Canadian vaccine. So as soon as I got on the airplane, I signed the consent and they put it in my arm uh, just about as we were taking off. I had the option to leave, 
you know, when, when other folks got sick there uh, of the locals, they were put in the Ebola treatment unit. And that's where a number of them died. Um, and these folks had been working for months. You know, I only was there for three weeks. So there was some guilt about that. Blood tests eventually came back negative. Dr. Rubinson never contracted Ebola. Because I happen to be born in America, you know, I get access to something. And if you happen to be born in Sierra Leone, sorry, your life is not worth as much. 40 health workers died at Kenema Hospital during the outbreak. Most of the international workers who got infected were evacuated. While many of them got access to experimental drugs, the majority of their West African co-workers were not so lucky. They would have to wait until clinical trials had begun. On October 8, 2014, Liberian Thomas Duncan died in a Texas hospital. He was the first victim of Ebola on American soil. Two nurses that treated him were also infected. Out front tonight, breaking news, a second possible Ebola case. Fear Ebola, as it was called at the time, caused widespread fear and panic across the U.S. Ebola was no longer confined to Africa. International aid workers were tracked down by authorities and the media. Some were quarantined, even when they had no symptoms. The number of people with Ebola in these areas could reach, could reach 1.4 million by January 20th. Fear of a global epidemic sent shockwaves through the stock market. Biotech companies working on Ebola saw their shares skyrocket. Suddenly, the VSV EBOV vaccine was a hot commodity, and Newlink entered a licensing agreement with pharmaceutical giant Merck for $50 million. The same license bought at $205,000. Byron Ammon is a research analyst covering the biotechnology field for Jefferies in New York. Newlink Genetics is one of the companies he follows. Before the epidemic, uh, what did you know about this Ebola vaccine? Oh, very little. I mean, the primary emphasis for New Link is largely in development of cancer therapeutics. So the company had not really spoken and, and talked about their developmental programs within infectious disease, such as the Ebola vaccine. So what do we see here? Small biotechnology companies like Newlink operate with a deficit for years, waiting for the opportunity to launch a breakthrough product on the market. Newlink shareholders are currently very optimistic about a promising pancreatic cancer treatment. Byron Ammon says the Ebola vaccine was not a priority. It would be very difficult for them. It would be much very resource intensive and it would divert their focus away from developing therapeutics for oncology purposes to, uh, to an Ebola vaccine. In the pharmaceutical field, every new drug needs a market. For investors, I mean, clearly they're looking for attractive markets, right? And so when you think of Ebola vaccine um, as, as a market, it's, it's not something that one can quantify easily. And I think that's where, where the difficulty lies. And I think this is something that they would shy away from. I, I don't want to attack them. I, I really don't want to. I mean, but it's, it's in this world, the capability to develop vaccines, unfortunately or fortunately, is really very narrow. It's mainly the major vaccine companies. It's not biotechnology. It's not. Dr. Adel Mahmoud is a leading expert in infectious diseases in the developing world. He was president of Merck Vaccines from 1998 to 2006. He believes only the big pharmaceutical companies have the infrastructure and resources to develop vaccines and bring them to market. But they also want a return on their investment. 
The public health agency said that they contacted many companies, among them big pharma companies, and they all said no thanks. So if the calculation will demonstrate that you don't have a potential market for the product to recoup your expenses, I mean, to develop a vaccine from the beginning of discovery to the deployment of the vaccine uh, as, a, as a product, the average cost is a billion dollar, a billion US dollar. For New Link, okay, why did they license the product from the Public Health Agency of Canada? My guess is uh, because they realize there are sources of money that are available in this country that they might be able to tap into it. So grants from the government. The grants from the government. Throughout the years, Newling Genetics received more than $7 million in grants from the U.S. Defense Department for research on various infectious diseases. Yet there is no mention of work specifically done on the VSV EBOV vaccine in either their press releases or financial reports. We tracked down the former Winnipeg lab scientist who went on to work for Newlink. He says he never saw work undertaken on the vaccine. The real active work in the laboratory, we have not done on that vaccine, at least during that time when I was there. Ramon Flick was chief of biodefense vaccines at Newlink until 2013. Because of the huge Ebola outbreak, it's got a boost. Before that, it was rather on a low burner because of the uh, not so potential profit range, you know. When Newlink acquired licensing rights from Canada, the contract required the company to deploy commercially reasonable efforts. Est-ce qu'on pensait vraiment que cette compagnie-là allait amener le vaccin sur le marché? Nous avions absolument toutes les, les certitudes à, à ce moment-là qu'elle qu était capable de, de faire son mandat. C'est une compagnie qui a démontré les expertises, qui a démontré les savoir-faire, qui a démontré qu'elle avait en main un plan d'affaires et les, et les étapes nécessaires à, à aller de l'avant. C'est sûr que pour une agence gouvernementale comme l'Agence de la santé publique du Canada, on ne s'aventure pas à faire des essais cliniques, on ne s'aventure pas à mettre en marché des produits d'une façon générale. In 2010, the Public Health Agency produced 1,500 vials for further testing on animals. Canada paid $887,000 for them. In theory, Newlink was supposed to step in and begin clinical trials on humans. Une fois qu'on a un, un lot clinique, le développement clinique de départ qu'on appelle la phase 1, c'est pas des gros montants d'argent. 250 000 pour faire une étude de, de clinique de phase 1 euh, de premier, premier niveau pour regarder si c'est vraiment sécuritaire, peut-être une dose ou deux, euh, moins de 50 personnes. Est-ce que vous saviez si la compagnie se préparait? Ce qu'on peut mentionner d'une façon euh, euh, directe, c'est que dans la dans la phase d'accord avec la compagnie, hein, c'est un accord qui est assez formel, la compagnie doit déposer un plan d'affaires. Est-ce qu'on savait quand ça allait commencer, les essais de phase 1? Euh, J'ai pas cette information-là avec moi. The agency refused to tell us what the business plan entailed, nor do we know what follow-ups with the company were carried out by the health agency. Our access to information requests were not answered. Newlink declined to comment on camera, but instead responded with an email. The company claims to have done a considerable amount of work on the vaccine in collaboration with the Canadian Public Health Agency. Newlink says it was in the process of negotiating with federal authorities and was almost ready for clinical trials when the outbreak began. But according to ex-employee Ramon Flick, the company had trouble getting government grants. And we had only like a supportive role and uh, give some input. There was usually discussion about how to get funding in, but uh, as far as I remember, everything failed. At the time of the outbreak, there had been no testing on humans. The crisis was growing, and precious months were being lost. As the death toll rose, the WHO was behind schedule in getting the vaccine to the front lines. But in December, the rate of infection in West Africa began to wane. The question on everyone's mind, 
would there now be enough cases to undertake clinical trials and determine its efficacy? June 2015, we are headed to Kagbelen Plateau, two hours away from Conakry, the capital of Guinea. A team of WHO health workers is taking us to the village where a child has died from Ebola. Today, people who have been in contact with the victim will be receiving the Canadian vaccine. The final phase of the vaccination trials to test the efficacy of the vaccine began three months ago in Guinea with frontline health workers and the affected communities. But it's a race against time. There are now only a handful of cases a week, perhaps jeopardizing trial results. By the time we arrive, the vaccination process is well underway. There are many participants among the villagers, and things are running smoothly. The population remains suspicious of anything to do with Ebola. The vaccination teams must first reassure people while remaining vigilant. For security reasons, the vaccination process takes place on the local chief's property. Oui, c'est tout. C'est pour donner l'exemple à la population. Ils sont venus d'abord expliquer faire l'explication. Nous aussi, on a sensibilisé, on a dit que c'est un essai. C'est pas une vaccination comme pour le passé. Les gens ont bien compris. Ils ont bien compris. C'est pour la science. Voilà, ils ont bien compris. Some groups are vaccinated immediately following possible exposure to a new case. Others, such as this one, are vaccinated three weeks later, which is the incubation period for the disease. The idea is to compare the number of new infections in both groups. La maladie qu'on a eu peur, le nom, le, le, la sale maladie là. Donc tout le monde a peur de ça. Il faut continuer, mais il y a encore des cas. Ce n'est pas terminé. Euh, et je pense que, que la, la, la méthodologie qu'on a choisie pour le faire va marcher et va nous permettre de voir si ce vaccin est efficace ou pas. The worst of the epidemic is over, but the hope now is to develop a weapon to fight the next outbreak. Most of the other vaccines and treatments tested during the epidemic showed disappointing results, either because of a declining number of cases, such as in Liberia, or because they proved to be ineffective. We believe that the world is on the, the verge of an efficacious Ebola vaccine. A month after our production team traveled to Guinea, the WHO released the preliminary results of the trial. The Canadian vaccine was proving to be 100% effective. Among those vaccinated immediately, there were no new cases. In the second group, vaccinated three weeks later, 16 people became infected. The clinical trials were conducted in record time. Good news for the World Health Organization that faced mounting criticism for its late response to the outbreak. But for Joanne Yu, whose organization participated in the trial, the successful outcome leaves a bittersweet taste. 
je vous dirais, la bonne chose de la panique globale planétaire, c'est qu'à un moment donné, les gens finissent par faire quelque chose. C'est quand même extraordinaire qu'est-ce qui s'est passé, parce que de façon générale, ça prend beaucoup plus de temps que ça. Cela dit, euh, c'est impardonnable, parce que si on avait fait notre boulot en amont euh, par rapport à cette maladie-là, bon, on n'aurait pas fait face à ce désastre-là. Et peut-être qu'on aurait prévenu, on parle de 11 000 décès, mais ben peut-être... Euh, plusieurs milliers. In the capital city, survivors Umar and Sekouturi are trying to piece their lives back together again. They have been taken in by an aunt. They are back in school. But they now face ongoing prejudice. Les gens pensent que d'une fois que vous êtes guéri de, de l'Ebola, d'une fois que d'une fois que vous êtes sorti, vous pouvez tous vous vous, ah, vous, vous contaminer certaines personnes. Certaines réagissent bien, certaines nous écartent. Vos anciens amis, est-ce que vous les voyez encore Non. Les relations, les relations qui vivent en moyenne, elles ne sont pas très fortes. Ebola will always be a disease of relatively poor countries and essentially probably of sub-Saharan Africa. And so there isn't a market there that's going to pay the sorts of amounts that are going to be required. In my view, this is true public health. And therefore, I think it has to be a combination of public, taxpayer, and philanthropy, and industry. In the future, when we do that basic science research, we must take it through to a point where if something happens, we can really fast track it. Il y a des produits comme ça qui sont nécessaires à développer, même si c'est pas un marché commercial en bout de ligne. Puis il faut pouvoir les identifier, puis trouver des partenaires pour que ces priorités-là, qui sont des priorités basées sur X, Y, Z, qu'on puisse les, les faire avancer aussi. The Canadian vaccine, now licensed by Merck, has yet to be approved by health authorities such as the FDA. In the meantime, Merck has committed to making 300,000 doses available in case of a new emergency. Do you think that without this 2014 outbreak, we would have seen one day an Ebola vaccine? We should have, because the vaccine candidates that were in the freezer were discovered around the end of the 20th century, the beginning of the 21st century. So they were in the freezer. The Canadian vaccine's journey is not a unique case. Other promising cures remain in limbo in what the pharmaceutical industry calls the valley of death. The very costly transition between discovering a drug and bringing it to market. There are lots of um, products like this for diseases that are in the freezers right now. SARS, MERS, Lassa fever, Marburg, Chikungunya, Nipah virus, West Nile, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Comment je vois un petit peu les choses, c'est que, euh, honnêtement, c'est probablement que la prochaine fois, l'épidémie euh, d'une telle ampleur, euh, elle ne s'appellera pas Ebola. Elle va s'appeler autre chose. Et, euh, et qu'à quelque part, on va être encore un peu pris par surprise. Mm. 